Okay, so we're going to take a look at some audio interfaces that are available out there. I was recently in the market to replace my old PreSonus Firebox, which was a good, reliable interface for many years, uh, but definitely is showing its age. So I was looking around, and from everything I read, I had a couple of good options. One was this very high-end interface called the Babyface Pro from RME. I could also go with something from Focusrite. The Scarlet Line is certainly something that's close to what I want. I have a old mixer from Mackie that has a USB audio interface that I wanted to include in my testing. And so really what this boiled down to is I wanted to know was the baby face worth the extra money because it's like twice as expensive as that Scarlet interface. So the utility I used is called RTL Utility. It's from Oblique Audio and available here on their website at oblique-audio.com slash free slash RTL Utility. And that utility is pretty handy because after you make a patch back uh, from the output of your audio interface back into the input and then launch the tool, uh, basically, you can send a little signal and wait to see how long it takes for your system to be able to detect the input. Uh, and that, that tells you a real good number in terms of the latency that you could expect to experience if, for instance, you were tracking a song, uh, especially while overdubbing. It also happens to measure things like noise floor, which I found to be very useful. So... When you run the tool, basically, what I did was I, I ran at a, at a variety of sample rates and a variety of driver latencies. All of the drivers, for the most part, offer the ability to either set the buffer size or set the number of milliseconds that you'd like for input latency. And so that allowed me to kind of cross-compare the interfaces and see what their performance was. Uh, as a baseline, I definitely captured the performance of my Firebox, uh, which as you can see here at a C CD quality level uh, with the lowest latency setting, uh, we're able to achieve input latency of roughly 12 milliseconds, uh, which is pretty fast. Um, I would consider anything under roughly 24 to be okay for tracking. So, uh, taking a look here, we see that the Firebox is, is pretty good at these lower input latency settings. And of course, as you increase the buffer, the performance decreases. Uh, the other thing, though, that you'll notice is that the noise floor on the Firebox is actually relatively high. So the noise floor, in short, it tells you how loud a signal has to be before you'll be able to distinguish it from the background static noise. Uh, that will be recorded on any electronic recording. Uh, it's inf affected by things like the temperature of the interface and components that are involved in the signal chain, the number of connections in that signal chain, and the quality of those connections, amongst other things. In the case of the Firebox, we see that a signal has to be fairly loud, uh, above roughly 80 dB, in order for us to detect it. What that results in is recordings that if, if you have many simultaneous tracks that were all captured on the device playing at the same time, you'll hear a stacking of that noise effect and you'll actually hear an audible hiss in those songs. I went through and tested the baby face at every sample rate that it offers uh, down below here and at every buffer setting that it offers in its drivers. And I captured all those speeds. As you can see, there's a lot of green there. I also did the same for the Scarlet. And you'll see, again, a lot more green there than what we saw with the Firebox earlier. So if we look at this together in a grouped chart, what we can see here is that, in general, the baby face is going to perform roughly twice as fast as the Scarlet. Uh, there are some cases where it's a little bit less noticeable than that, but uh, certainly that's a good rule of thumb. And basically, at the lower quality settings, the buffer size, even up to half a meg, is 
sufficient to do tracking with. It's below that 24 milliseconds uh, uh, cutoff. And we also see that the Scarlet is able to keep relatively on pace. You know, it would certainly be close enough to not notice uh, in, in most scenarios here. But what you also saw on the other chart is that the noise floor seems to be impacted by the Scarlet as we increase quality in the sample rate and increase our buffer size. So I'm going to eliminate noise floors off the list here. And as I do this, I'm excluding them from my chart. And what you'll see is that for the most part, the items that are disappearing as I remove noise floors are items from the Scarlet's row. The baby face is able to maintain an amazingly low noise floor, even at high sample rates and large buffer sizes. And as I keep doing this, let's say that we wanted our device to never have a noise floor that was worse than a, a, hundred D, a negative 100 dB. Well, the baby face is obviously our choice for that because the Scarlet is simply just not able to support that kind of noise floor at the high sample rates if we ever need to record those. As I continue eliminating them, you'll see the same trend continue. So what you see there when I get to the very end of what I can eliminate before the data gets uninteresting is that the Scarlet at its CD quality setting and its lowest buffer setting, that's where it's able to have a noise floor that is pretty darn low at negative 106 and a half dB. That is basically in line with what they advertise for the noise floor of the device, but it's simply not able to support that noise floor at the higher sample rates or higher buffer settings. For that, we definitely need the baby face. So this is RME's driver interface for changing your buffer size or input latency. With lower buffers, you will have less input latency. Uh, at higher buffers, you will be able to support more effects in your DAW program uh, without so much CPU load. So often we track at lower buffer sizes and mix and master at higher buffer sizes. You'll notice that its maximum buffer size is roughly 2,000 samples, which is important uh, when we get to comparison to the focus rate. Here is a look at the mixing interface that you get with the Babyface. Uh, this is part of their free software. Uh, there is also a iPhone remote control app that you can use and, or excuse me, there's also an iPad remote control app that you can use. Uh, the, the interface is laid out like a mixer. So if you are familiar with uh, doing mixing on an actual mixing board, then you'll feel rel relatively at home. Um, there are a few tricks to it, but you can quickly learn the ins and outs of it. Uh, the real trick is just to leave that submix button on, uh, assign your phones out to be three fourths that you see it here. Then you can select that as your output and all the faders that you see now on the screen are for the output from that channel to my phones. So if I change to like the main channel, you'll see my microphone that I'm currently talking on is not going to my main at all, but it is going to my phones. If I had software playing back sounds, like for instance, this uh, window sound, we'll see it appear right here, because that's where I have my Windows Audio mapped out to. So you can work your way around here. You can save snapshots, um, and that's helpful. Uh, but it's not the most intuitive thing, especially if you've never used a mixer before. All right, and one other thing. Let's take a look at how the driver has exposed our inputs and outputs to various Windows applications that do not use ASIO. So that would be things like Skype, uh, your favorite game, uh, your internet browser, Microsoft Windows itself. If you want to hear any of that through your audio interface or be able to capture any of that audio through your audio interface, then it needs to be exposed to Windows via a WDM driver or to your Macintosh 
uh, using its driver. As we can see here, uh, we can see several devices listed for output on the baby face. We can see a few different devices listed for input on that baby face as well. And that is extremely helpful. If we open up, for instance, uh, Skype has a an issue where if you want to be able to hear uh, send two microphones out on one Skype call, um, like for instance, you have two people that are involved in a podcast in the same room and you're podcasting with someone uh, over Skype uh, who's remotely located. Well, if they want to be able to hear both of you, uh, that can be an issue in Skype because it will only pay attention to input one on most channels. Uh, however, if you tell, for instance, Skype to listen to ADAT34, and then you map both microphone outputs in total mix out to 3.4, uh, and everything is set up properly here and in Skype, then that will work. And you can do so without the use of any patch cables, which can be very, very helpful. So let's take a quick look at the Focusrite driver software. Uh, we have a simple control panel that lets us select a sample rate and it lets us select a buffer size. We are given uh, an option to choose buffer sizes that are in multiples of 16, uh, which is interesting because you'll notice that it, it tops out at 1024, which is actually half the size of the maximum buffer of the RME babyface. The accompanying mixing software that we get with our Focusrite device allows us to select one of our presets. It allows me to select a preset and then customize it after that. So uh, just as you know, an average computer user, uh, kind of intuitively I can feel like I can click on these things, like the monitor, okay, so this must be my main out, one, two. Here's headphones, one, so that must be three, four, maybe. Uh, so, if I try and figure this out, you know, I can either start here, custom mix, and it changes in, in real time. Uh, again, I can go to my headphones, so I can give myself a, a custom mix. I can add the additional advertised outputs. So, outputs 1, 2 are the only ones that are exposed to Windows applications, but if you have an application that is interacting with your device using its ASIO driver, then that application should be able to send audio output to outputs 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, 8. So if you need to do something like that, you should be able to accomplish that as long as you have that software. You just can't accomplish it only standing on the interface's software and the interface's mixer itself. Finally, I'll note that this audio for this portion of the video was recorded on the Focusrite interface. And so if you compare this part of the video to the earlier part, you may hear a difference in audio quality. And part of that is going to be the result of the patch cable I had to use in order to monitor everything in real time. Part of it is going to just be the result of the lower quality of the Scarlet interface.